Ladies and gentlemen, please take this opportunity to move to your seats so we may begin the program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Executive Vice President of AFA, Major General Doug Rayberg. Good morning, please have a seat. Thank you, the Air Force Association is once again excited to host the finals of the third annual Spark Tank competition, get ready. The spirit of innovation has sparked us to join AFWorks at the Spark Collider at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, 10 through 12 March, as small businesses meet DOD and venture capital stakeholders to match defense problems with viable solutions. So, backed by popular demand, this morning's Spark Tank calls for airmen to pitch their innovative ideas to a panel of distinguished judges for funding and senior level support. I am pleased to introduce our host for today's competition, Lauren K plus 12 Knossenberger and Tony Perez, over to you two. Good morning, AFA! Let's get ready to rumble! for Spark Tank 2020. Let's put your hands together now, loud and thunderous applause you, for our hosts and judges, Lauren Knausenberger and Tony Perez. Thank hey, you, thank Orlando. You. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Queso. It, it's great to see you up here, buddy, but I, I host this every year with Alec Baldwin. Like, well, what, what are you doing here? Well, Lauren, I mean, you have to understand, Alex pre is pretty expensive, and we have a lot of satellites and rockets that we have to buy. Oh, okay. Um, you know, rockets are pretty darn cool, though. So I guess, I, you know, I, I can get on board with that. Yeah, you know, and so even though you don't have Alec, you have me. Elon Musk is going to be here later today to celebrate Space Force's launch. Yeah, you know, I love it. I love Elon, and you know, in honor of Elon, I even brought my Nuke Mars t-shirt. <laughs> you know, Tony, uh, it always amazes me the pockets you guys have. What else do you keep in there? It's, it's like Mary Poppins. <laughs> so today, once again, we are here to celebrate our Air Force risk takers and idea makers those bold airmen who reject the status quo and have come up with innovative solutions to help us bring our very best to the fight. And in only two months, 
We had over 200 ideas submitted by airmen from all across the Air Force. And today you're gonna see those six finalists here on stage pitching their ideas to our celebrity investors to get investment money, bureaucracy busting, and the coveted Spark Tank 3D printed trophy. And now it's time for Spark Tank 2020. Let's meet our celebrity investors. Our first judge is a billionaire investor with annual R&D spend exceeding that of Amazon and Apple combined. She's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, is an instrument rated pilot, and has completed astronaut training. So this makes her qualified in both the F-16 and the Falcon Heavy. But no matter how you look at it, she is going to bring the Air Force to new heights. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our 25th Secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Barbara Barrett. And now, Tony Whitley Jones is the president of Microsoft Regulated Industries, responsible for over $14 billion in business and 2,000 people worldwide. She was once a semi pro soccer star in Canada. And after 10 years, she is still trying to finish her original screenplay, a contemporary love story titled Bololo, which means heaven in a Nigerian dialect. Please welcome Tony Whitley Towns. Our next judge is the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General David Goldfein. I don't know if you know this, but he was on the six-year plan at the Air Force Academy. As a cadet, he left on his 10-speed bicycle to follow Harry Shapin's band as a roadie. You know, it's like the Justin Bieber of the 1970s. After a year on the open road with his trusty dog, Mini Bear, he returned to the academy. Please welcome the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General David Goldfein. And our next judge has watched Top Gun over 20 times and done an analysis to determine if an Air Force F-15 could take out Maverick and Goose. Let's meet Gene Kim. He's a award-winning CTO of Tripwire and the author of some of our favorite books to include The Unicorn Project, The Phoenix Project, and Accelerate. Please welcome Gene Kim. Legend has it that Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Khalif O. Wright, wrote the Ten Commandments of Servant Leadership, and that he walks on water every day to serve our listed force of over 250,000 airmen. He also reads two books a week, has an outstanding golf handicap, and still has time to root for the Dallas Cowboys. Chief, great to see you. All right, so it's about time to start this year's competition. While it is a competition, it's really about turning these ideas into reality. Last year, John Moss took the uh, Spark Tank trophy, and with his idea to take chemical detection and make them ready all the time, his idea took an operation that uh, required 300 batteries changed by airmen every day and streamlined it. So with that, please, Look at John's video. Spark Tank has just been an amazing experience for me. Uh, being able to see an idea that I had, uh, get the support that it needed, and go through that process of, of trying to make it a reality. Nothing here gets done without a team. And so I'd like to thank a couple people as well, especially my wife, she's been there the entire time, both ups and downs, supervisors, commanders, uh, the AFWORKS team, they're like family to me now, and also the uh, Air Force Civil Engineer Center and the Air Force Installation Mission Support Center. That crew has been instrumental in taking that concept and, and making it a reality. So we've got some of the smartest airmen out there right now. They're innovative and they're creative, but sometimes their ideas, they feel like they're, they're not being listened to. But I can tell you right now, processes like this, like Spark Tank, give a voice back to the airmen. 
So don't be afraid. Talk to your supervisors, talk to your commanders, get those ideas out there, get supported and get them funded. All right. Well done, John. And John, I think you're here with your family today. Where are you? Can you stand up? All right, let's hear it for John. All right. So we're back here today. As always, our team members, they're going to have three minutes to pitch our team of celebrity judges. Our judges will speak with them for about four minutes. They'll get to ask some questions, share some insights, and then they get to tell us whether they're in or out. And you, the audience and all the airmen out there, you have a vote. So log on to the live poll and cast your vote now. All right, let's meet these teams. Good luck, everyone. All right, first stop into the spark tank is the K-Wedge C-17 loading aid. Like bumpers in a bowling alley, this project makes sure our C-17 cargo makes it down the lane safely without damaging the aircraft. Good morning, AFA. Good morning, judges. I'm Staff Sergeant Davis. I am an aircraft metals technologist from the 1st Maintenance Squadron at a Langley Air Force Base. And I'm Tech Sergeant Brett Kaiser, a proud port dog from the 8th Expeditionary Air Mobility Squadron located in Al Udid Air Base, Qatar. Today, we're going to highlight how the C-17 fleet is being damaged during cargo loading operations, which reduces our ability to provide agile combat support to the joint force. We're also going to discuss our solution which is gonna propel our battlefield capabilities as well as protect our most precious resource, you, the warfighter. So the problem is actually pretty simple. During cargo loading operations on the C-17, heavy cargo pallets are striking and damaging the exposed logistic rail system. And this has been happening for over two decades. Here's what some of that damage looks like. We have bent actuators, bent rails, and even broken rails. And in 2019 alone, there was $2.3 million in wasted airlift and aircraft damage. But the monetary loss isn't the worst part. It's our loss to our logistical capabilities. For instance, in Al Udid, we ship human blood and munitions on a daily basis to the front lines. And so when these rail incidents occur, we can no longer lock the pallet in place so they get bumped off the flight, which means we're delaying bombs on target and life-saving blood transfusions from reaching injured combat victims. And we simply cannot put a price tag on the life of a service member, or anyone else for that matter. Which is why I collaborated to innovate with my partner over here, the 379th Expeditionary Maintenance Squadron, and together we collaborated and innovated this. Introducing the K-Wedge, a three-piece C-17 loading aid designed to protect the leading edge of the logistic rail system while also reinforcing the outboard rails for pallet spinning. It's made from 3 16th inch steel plates. It only costs $500 of manpower material and it only takes five hours to fabricate. The best part about the K-Wedge is the installation. In under 60 seconds, you can secure all three pieces of the K-Wedge to the aircraft floor using existing aircraft tie-down rings and a cargo strap to effectively safeguard the rail system. And how do we know that? Because we tested it for two months in LUD. And during that time, we launched 29 missions consisting of 330 cargo pallets, resulting in zero rail mishaps and zero K-Wedge defects. In comparison, in comparison, there were six rail mishaps across the fleet during that time, which effectively proves that the K-Wedge is needed to safeguard aircraft components. Our final request is that we get with AMC's A3, A4, and the C-17 program office to rapidly certify us for aircraft use. And we're requesting $250,000 to review material options, modernize, and equip the entire C-17 fleet. It's time to do better for our airmen, for the next generation. And we know the C-17 is going to propel rapid global mobility for decades to come. So how much longer are we going to wait before we decide to start saving millions of dollars and potential lives? The choice is up to you. Thank you. And judges, over to you. So. Kaiser, are you saying for $250,000 we can outfit the entire C-17 fleet with, with these? Yes, sir, we can. 
Yeah, man. I, I mean, I think this is a no-brainer, especially given the <laughs> <laughs> right uh, the justification that that you had for the things that we might be missing out on the cargo that's being kicked off uh, pallets, especially in the AOR. So, man, I'm I'm all for this. Hey, two questions. One. Uh, uh, other applications to C-130s, others, uh, can it, can it, is it C-17 only or can it be modified for others? And then also uh, international, because there's others out there that are even, it's even a broader market. Yes, sir. And so in our last slide, uh, we actually, well, there's eight other allied uh, partners that we can share this technology with. And to answer your first question, um, it's only for the C-17 because the logistic rail system on that aircraft is the only one out of the C-130 and the C-5 that are exposed. Um, when you flip them up, they're just thin pieces of aluminum, and when the pallets hit the omnidirectional rollers, it just strikes uh, the rail system. The only other application, I guess, would be, you know, we could use that in hand-to-hand -hand combat and it could help out. <laughs> Judges, do we have a spark? Uh, airmen need to be able to solve problems in daily work. I think this is ingenious. It gets a spark from me. Yeah. I agree. I'm seconding. Absolutely. It gets yeah. a spark. You get a spark from me. You, you get one from me, but for, uh, for, our, uh, for our acquisition and A4 community, I really do want to look at this beyond the C-17. I think this has got broader application, and I really want to look at it for an international market because I think what you've got here is much bigger than what you're thinking. Yes, sir. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much, Judge. Great job, gentlemen. Walking into the spark tank is the robotic process automation team, deploying an army of bots to do mundane, mundane tasks that airmen just don't want to do anymore. To give those airmen time, back to the mission. I'm Tech Sergeant Sherrod James Overbay. And I'm Captain Melinda Monahan. We're joining you today from the Air Force Personnel Center to introduce you to the Digital Airmen. For 12 years, I've been a personnelist in the United States Air Force. For my entire career, I've been doing nothing but manual and repetitive processes. Not only that, it frustrated me to the point where I tried to retrain out of my career field two times just so I could feel like I was of value <laughs> to our Air Force. <laughs> but that's just me. At AFPC, we have 2,500 airmen who are doing those same type of processes, serving two nearly 2 million uh, customers who are airmen, retirees, and their families. That motivated us to come up with our solution, robotic process automation. RPA is a software that mimics the activities and actions of a worker on their computer, and then it automates the process that they're working. Not only that, we created a process at AFPC as a proof of concept to automate the permanent change of station orders authentication, and it's already saved us 15,000 man hours, and we developed it at a cost of less than $5,000 in under 20 hours of work. Not only that, we have authority to operate on the Air Force network, so we're ready to deploy these bots whenever we can have the work. That's just the beginning. Imagine if we develop 10 of these bots a month we could have 1.8 million hours saved annually, and we could liberate 616 airmen from these antiquated processes, <laughs> thus saving the Air Force $72 million. And we don't just have to imagine this. We have a digital airman right now at AFPC authenticating orders as we stand on this stage. That's proof of the potential of this technology. And think about right now, like all the times you find yourself doing the same tasks day in and day out, it's repetitive work, or maybe you're at Space Command and you're looking at 5,000 applications to hire just 31 positions, and you're thinking to yourself, how can I do this better? Or maybe there's a bot for that? Well, you're right, there is. At AFPC alone, we have 700 processes that are manual, that are ripe for automation. And what we need to do is to establish a, a robotic center of excellence at AFPC to go ahead and start getting after these projects so that our airmen are not worried about these processes or the paperwork, but we're actually taking care of our customer, all of you out in the crowd and you on the stage. So that's what we want to do. 
Our ask, we need $900,000. This will allow us to hire the right people in these critical roles and to pay for the software, equipment, and training necessary to ensure that we're able to relentlessly develop and deploy these bots. The return on investment is so much more than what you see of 72 million, it's the intangibles, right? So we're improving accuracy by reducing human error. We're improving, uh, we're empowering our airmen by allowing them to stop doing those mundane ta tasks and allowing them to do the art of what they want to do, which directly enhances our customer experience, increases readiness, and modernizes our work at a low cost. So judges, audience, are you ready for the digital airmen? It sounds like it improves the experience for, for you guys, and, and kudos to you. I think you developed this, right? You learned how to code. Man, that's yes, sir. That right. That's pretty amazing. Uh, but what does it do for uh, the airmen out in the Air Force? How it, does it allow them to get their orders faster? Does it improve the experience of the warfighter? Yes, sir. Um, it allows our proof of concept already uh, has uh, increased our orders production, as well as RPA can help airmen um, get their pay faster and all these other transactions. And the great thing about RPA, because it eliminates human error, those um, mistakes that we make, and I know I've made a couple that's resulted in people not getting paid, I'm admit that <laughs> right now, that, that, that it, it eliminates that, those errors and also fixes those errors in an yeah. increased space. And is it scalable to other parts of the Air Force, finance and? Uh, Absolutely, we're, we're actually working with SAF FM right now. They're already looking at the same technology we're using in the personnel world. So imagine if we set up the center of excellence, we're able to define what the governance looks like, determine best practices, and help scale that for other communities such as FM as an example. Okay. This is, this is phenomenal. First of all, congratulations for having learned robotics and RPA on your own and, and bringing this innovation. Um, let me just ask a couple quick questions. We talk about the 2,500 airmen that are part of this that we're gonna liberate. I love the word there. Uh, we'll think about that one for a while in tech. So liberating. So what will be the new skill set or task or focus of those who, have met, who are no longer part of this sort of mundane process? So for our career field at AFPC, we, we service all Air Force customers and we spend a lot of time just clicking, copying, pasting, and putting things into spreadsheets instead of, let's say, uh, we have members who have special, fa special needs family members who need to only go to certain areas around the United States. We need airmen who can communicate with them and their needs to put them in the right place so their family can get help instead of those airmen copying and pasting and transferring data to different systems where the bot can do that. So direct customer service. Okay, so let me just also ask, cognitive, on your bot framework, how cognitive is this capability that you've built in terms of being able to predict, let's say, the, the more sophisticated aspects of your AI platform? Where, where are you right now in your maturity? So there's no AI, but we can't, we build in if-then statements and conditions so that if it can't find a certain condition that it's looking for, it can do another action and go from there. And we can even build it to a point where if it finds that it needs human interaction, it can stop and cue a technician that, hey, can you come and see this? And that technician can take care of that and then restart the bot and the bot can keep going on until it finds the next error. Uh, that sounds pretty good for a first step though. So look, from you're in the Microsoft wheelhouse right here. We love this. So uh, <laughs> I have to admit bias and we, whenever we come to this decision, uh, of course I know there'll be a spark question down the line here, but uh, we'd be happy to, to support in, beyond even this conversation because we think you're onto something. Thank, Thank you, man. man. Thank you. So I have a daughter who's in the Air Force. She keeps me grounded. <laughs> and she has this great quote. She said, Dad, you know, I don't know what hell looks like, but I know, I know I'm there if I have to file a voucher on DTS to get out. <laughs> right? And have to do 60 hours of computer-based training, right? So I think you're really onto something. The question is uh, sustainment. Right? How do we sustain this? Because, you know, forms are going to change, processes are going to change, right? So one of the challenges is if we get this where it is and it's in a snapshot in time, sort of Dr. Roper's discussion, right? How do, how do we keep this fresh? Have you thought about that? And we'll have to keep it faster. We're at time. So um, not only can this software 
um, the bots can keep fresh with the new technologies coming out. It can interact with distant systems. And let's say we have our digital transformation go through with our new technologies. It can interact and bridge those technologies so the member doesn't have to go from this source to that source. As well as new processes come up, we can automate those new processes as well. And also, as, as we go through and automate these processes, we find out the best practices and the most effective way to automate in the future. Okay, judges, do we have a spark? We got a spark. We got, we got a spark. spark. You guys work for me. All right, well done, guys. Well done. Good job, guys. Next into the spark tank. Now, the chief didn't know in advance that his aircraft would be intercepted by a missile. Why should pilots train against static threats? Introducing the dynamic threat emitter team. Good morning, Spark Tank. I'm Captain Coyle. I'm here with Lieutenant Treese. We're intel officers at the 56th Fighter Wing at Luke Air Force Base, where it's our mission to train the world's greatest fighter pilots and combat-ready airmen. We're here with Wiley Standage Buyer. He's a PhD student at Arizona State University. And we have an idea that could revolutionize the way that we train in a dense threat environment. This threat environment he's talking about consists of these. This is a surface-to-air missile system it uses a radar to detect aircraft and guides missiles to a target. We use systems like this, commonly referred to as umpties or unmanned threat emitters, to replicate those threat radar signals and train our pilots. At Luke Air Force Base, we have the largest number of F-35 pilots in the world, and we need to get them ready for the next fight. For instance, a strategic competitor threat environment consists of multiple different threats, many of which are mobile and can pick up and move within minutes. We need to incorporate that mobility and quantity into our training. But we can't do that. For example, at Luke Air Force Base, we have a training range with airspace the size of Connecticut. But we only have four threat emitters to work with. And at five to six million dollars a piece, it would cost upwards of a hundred million dollars to create a realistic threat environment. Trust me, we hear our pilots complain about it all the time. It's a problem. We need to supplement our current inventory with something that's more affordable and that we can put out in quantity. And that's what sparked our idea. Yeah, so there we were, creating another training scenario, putting the same threats in the same place. And I looked over at Treese and I said, dude, we got to get some more emitters. Yes, we do. You want to try to build one? <laughs> we could try. So we did some research. We reached out to Arizona State University. They agreed to help. Wiley came down. We put together a team at Luke Air Force Base, and within months, we built this. We call it the Dumpty, the Dynamic Unmanned Threat Emitter. It uses a software-defined radio to digitally recreate radar waveforms. Our interface allows us to manipulate the signal and change the threat within seconds. And not only is it compact and mobile, but it's also cost-effective. We expect to put 50 Dumpties out on the range for the cost of just one of these modern threat emitter systems. The main difference is that ours operates at a low power. But the beauty of our modern avionics is that they're designed to detect low power emissions. And I'm not just talking about the Air Force F-35. The Marines, the Navy, our coalition partners fly them as well. Even aircraft like the F-22 or some of our ISR platforms could benefit from an innovation like this. But we need your sponsorship to break through some of our barriers. We're looking to partner up with AFRL and we're asking for $1.5 million to get us through testing research and development, and the fielding of several minimum viable products that we can start using to determine requirements and transfer this over to the warfighter. As we start to think about and train to multi-domain operations, imagine the possibilities. We have the opportunity to cost-effectively increase our lethality, our survivability, and our readiness, and prepare the joint force for a fight against a strategic competitor in a dense threat environment. Thank you. Judges, over to you. I'd love to know what the process was to find components where you can build something for less than $5 million. We found them on the internet. <laughs> um, in fact, prototype number one was built solely off parts straight out of Amazon. Wow. <laughs> and I love the fact that you work with uh, universities. Uh, what did you learn out of that experience? Well, uh, it, it's actually a funny story. It kind of happened by accident. We were, 
we were doing some research on whether or not this was possible, and we got on onto the website. We we see these uh, innovation buses rolling around town all the time. They talk about ASU is number one in innovation. So we called them up. We, we found uh, Dr. Bliss. We, we saw his bio on there. and We saw the work he had been doing with software to find radio. So Teresa and I just cold called him one day. And uh, we got the right guy because he agreed to help. Uh, he, he, said, he said what we were doing is, is important and that, that we should be able to, to do this relatively easy. Uh, good for you. It's awesome. Yes, I want to ask the uh, MAGCOM commanders what you're thinking about this. It's a great idea. I wonder how you're going to do it. <laughs> well, the theory right now, and this needs some testing, but the theory is that we can just scan this over a sector of airspace, uh, and then it, the, the sensors on the jet will be able to pick it up and locate it. That's a big deal because the, the pointing for an antenna like this becomes very, very expensive. Right? So we're... We're banking on the idea that, that this should work. In theory, and the science behind it tells us it should. Yesterday, I told a story about uh, one of our obligations of producing confidence under fire because folks get to a point where they say, OK, I've, I've been there. This is not new. Uh, this is potentially a game changer on producing that kind of confidence. So you get a spark from me. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. Judges, do we have a spark? You're helping train airmen cheaper, faster, better, and uh, leveraging universities to do that. I guess a spark from me. Spark here as well. Spark here. Couldn't be better. Thanks so very Thanks. much. Great job. All right. They're, they're short winded today. All right. Well done. And next into the spark tank is the battery cell extraction tool team. Civilized airmen don't open their wine bottles with brute force when they have a corkscrew. Introducing the corkscrew for battery cell extraction. Good morning, Sparks. Good morning, air and space professionals. My name is Rob Tingle. And I'm Roy Pachalski. And we are citizen airmen from the 446 Airlift Wing, Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington, here representing Air Force Reserve Command. We are pumped to be here today to show you what can happen when you empower the airmen to innovate solutions to the problems impacting mission and morale. Sitting here in front of you is just one example of the types of solutions that we are working on every day at our Metals Technology Work Center. For decades, battery technicians have struggled with using brute force to remove these battery cells during disassembly with T-handles. This typically ends up in one or more airmen pressing this 80-pound battery to the floor while another is asked to pull up as hard as they can. This often results in cell damage. Just the slightest off-angle pull can snap an otherwise serviceable $1,000 battery cell contributing to the $135,000 in annual cell replacement costs at our location. More important than cost savings, though, what about the quality of life for your proud maintainers? This procedure is ergonomically terrible for the technician. We even had an airman split their forehead open when they were pulling with all their strength. It's just not how we should be doing business. Now, Sparks, direct your attention to the battery cell extraction tool. This compact, leverage-based solution gives the technician mechanical advantage, completely eliminating the risk of damage and injury. A single technician can now perform this task in half the time. We had a visit to our location from our C-17 coalition partners, and they loved this prototype so much, they asked if they could take it home with them. <laughs> well, if we had additive manufacturing capability at our location, we could have already rapidly deployed this solution to over 20 locations, supporting over 300 aircraft, and saved the Air Force over $360,000 annually. With your support to get this out to the fleets quickly, the return on investment is less than two years. 
The rest of the time can be spent on our other valuable joint operation innovations, many of which continue to sit at other locations 3D print queues while we wait for them to get accomplished for us, which brings us to our ask. Judges, we're here today asking for a one-time investment of just $750,000 to purchase a state-of-the-art printer, 3D printer, that will not only expedite the build on this uh, battery cell extracting tool, but other tools and support equipment as well. With additive manufacturing capabilities, will not only eliminate the three to 12 month current backlog we're experiencing in our own shop with outsourcing parts, but will uh, encourage innovative airmen to up-channel their ideas and without that typical delay that will crush their creativity. With your investment in our innovation vision, we'll immediately be ready to face future challenges head on. Thank you. Let's talk scale. So one printer, how is that gonna, you know, against what you think is the demand out there, Walk us through why you think that will meet the demand in terms of supply. Will one 3D printer do it, or is this just going to be a local fix? Well, at the point right now, sir, during our research, we don't have the excess capacity in, out in the, uh, our Air Force to handle other people bringing mass quantity projects to take their 3D printer usage. So this will help us get this tool out to the fleets, but it doesn't just end here. Uh, and it's not just an aircraft maintenance application. We, this helps with um, our sheet metal technicians do brake housing protectors while they do scheduled maintenance, but it also helps pilots. We helped prototype a, an iPad mount for them to hold their 3D, uh, or to hold their flight charts, digital flight charts in the flight deck, and it doesn't end there. Aeromedical panels keep cracking under stress so we can help our flight docs and our nurses complete their mission. Any airman with a spark that comes to us, we will help you turn that spark into fire. <laughs> So, it sounds a little bit like this is more about the 3D printer than, than this tool because you, you're saying you can do so many other things, but in terms of being able to mass produce these, is that all you need is the one state-of-the-art 3D printer? With the 3D printer, we can have this tool pushed out to every location that needs it in less than two months and begin that return on investment. How are we going to spark more ideas like this and uh, more uses like your uh, iPhone holder? Great question, ma'am. We're already doing it. AFWorks, our local innovative uh, agencies and our PA teams are pushing out um, what we've been working on. And we actually have a space available. The McCord Innovation Lab is ready to go. We have the spot taped off in our shop. All we need is the equipment. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like what we want, what you're looking for though, is to get the 3D printer, right? And then manufacture these plus what you held up plus all the other things that you want in your shop to be able to get this out to the field. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I think you're. I think you've got you got us sold on this. I do want to have our folks work with you on how do we scale this quickly, mm -hmm. because I'm not sure the one 3D printer is going to do what you're looking for. And, and we want to get to a point in our Air Force where we are doing 3D printing as part of our expeditionary force, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we got to get, we, I mean, we got to think about, you know, printing parts when, when the big one goes, right? We got to assume that our logistics train is going to be under attack. And so what that means is we're going to have to be, we're going to be taking risk and printing parts, you know, in Estonia, in, you know, you name it, where we're deployed forward. So you get a spark from me, I do think we got to, step back and take a look at the way we get about this to scale it quickly. Yes, sir. Thank you. I love it. I think this is exactly just a phenomenal example of what Dr. Roper talked about, unleashing creativity at the edges, uh, allowing airmen to solve problems. Uh, spark from me. Thank you, Gene. Okay. You got a spark here, particularly with the 60-day turnaround. I think that's about yes, as best I can hear in terms of deployment, so definitely get a spark here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Spark yeah. here. Well, in that case, yep. please help us turn this check into a reality.
Entering the spark tank now, the Team Mercury. Streamlining multiple weapon loading checklists into one smart checklist. A turbo tax for weapons loading. Smart indeed. Good morning. I'm Master Sergeant Gabriel Valenzuela from Spengdalem Air Base, Germany. And this is I am Brothers, a user experience designer representing Bespin. Judges, I bet if I asked you to assemble this chair with a simple set of instructions, it'd be easy. However, what if there were stacks and stacks of these, mat, uh, of these instructions all around this chair? You had to locate your steps, assemble them, arrange them in order, and then assemble this chair. That would be a lot more difficult. This is the same pain that our airmen go through on a daily basis when loading weapons on aircraft. Oftentimes, they have to sort through upwards of 840 steps just to find the minimal steps that are required to load an aircraft. But we have a solution. We've developed Mercury, an agile checklist system capable of utilizing input conditions that filters and arranges steps from multiple technical orders to give our airmen a single streamline checklist. How do we do this, you might ask? Well, our team from Spengdalem collaborated with Kessel Run, MGM Works, Bespin, and the 187th Red Tails out of Montgomery, Alabama. And in just six months, we evolved Mercury from an idea to a prototype. And recently, our solution inspired the USAFE commander to invest $342,000 to take our software to the next level. Today, we have a fully functioning accredited software with authority to operate on DOD servers. And we can load five of our 25 munitions on an F-16. Best of all, this is scalable across all weapons platforms or any other career field for that matter. Judges, with Mercury, we can load aircraft 36% faster, which means we cut 28 minutes from the overall load time of an F-16. Implemented across the F-16 fleet, we anticipate a cost savings of 682,000 man hours, which equates to $27 million annually. But the real value is its impact on combat readiness. That's 28 minutes quicker we get our F-16s to the fight. That's 28 minutes less our aircraft are exposed to, chemo, to, to enemy attack. Chief Wright, that's 28 minutes less our airmen are in a chemical environment and it goes on and on. Additionally, this will advance agile combat employment by reducing load times. And by simplifying weapons loading, it facilitates a multi-capable airman initiative. Judges, I'm here to ask you for $1.4 million to add the remaining 20 munitions and further develop, implement, and test our software. But in reality, I'm here to ask you for $1.4 million for 28 minutes because that can be the difference between life and death or victory and defeat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chief. I, I love this because uh, this is what software is for. Uh, but I understand that there's actually someone who really wants to use this but can't right now. Can you tell us who that is and why they care so much about it? Sir, that's great that you asked me that question because absolutely, our weapons community have been wanting this for decades. I mean, matter of fact, Ian, weren't you just at the 187 Red Tails a couple days? Did you get some feedback there? Absolutely, so we were able to bring this to the flight line at the 187th out of Montgomery and put it in the hands of the weapon loaders and they, took the app, I said, we'd like you to load an AIM-9 and AIM-120 and hand it to them. They are able to build their checklist and do the load without delay. And some of the quotes we got from the users was, man, that was awesome. That reduced the complexity greatly from what we're used to. And wow, that was so easy. I love this one, can I have it? In fact, when, when I was getting ready to leave, it was hard to pull it away from the hands of the team chief. <laughs> she wanted to hold on to it. And who specifically said they wanted it? 
So that, that's all of our, our weapons loaders, sir. And I'll tell you why they don't want to put this down. It's because their process right now is so broken. I mean, on a monthly basis, they get evaluated. And oftentimes, they fail their evaluations based off checklist errors or because they go overtime. That's right. We also hold them to a time standard. It's the same stress that our airmen go through when they're performing a PT test. We're essentially <laughs> tying them to a ball and chain and asking them to go run. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sirs, ma'am, we have to cost effectively modernize and we've done it, right? This is, this is how we get, we free our airmen from that ball and chain. Additionally, this will increase safety and munition reliability because they don't have to navigate through these complex checklists. We want them focused on a safe and reliable operation. Where would you take it next? Ma'am, we're gonna take this. First, we gotta get F-16s right. We're gonna test, implement, and make sure this is completely reliable. After that, it's easily scalable across any other MDS. Matter of fact, where's Tech Sergeant Benavides? Stand up. That's my F-15 guy at Seymour Johnson. Chief Wright, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Flag, he's a, he's a global strike MATCHCOM functional manager. I have teams right now ready to work in parallel with me to get this software to the rest of our aircraft. Is, is this applicable to your dual capable aircraft that you have uh, in the inventory, the F-16s? Yes, sir. This is applicable to any, uh, any aircraft, even our foreign partners. They're using the same technical data that we're using. So absolutely, this, this will work across the board. So given the scalability you're referencing, what does 1.4 million get you in terms of that iteration? That investment results in what level of scale? So that investment, in, in addition to the angel investment that our USAFE commander gave us, uh, gets F-16s right. It's all so, just F-16? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We have to add the remaining 20 munitions and further implement and test it. So the time saving is not that you're changing the method of loading. The time change is that you're no longer using paper checklists. Is that the major time savings? Uh, yes, sir. So not only that, but <laughs> 10 years ago, we took our paper checklists and we converted them to PDF and put them on a tablet. I mean, it made it worse and it's more time consuming. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one thing uh, we're looking at right in AETC is maintenance training next, pilot training next, using visual reality. Uh, did you think, is, is there any application there to be able to marry what you're doing here with that kind of training? Absolutely, sir. So since the inception of this software, we've left it open and then we want so many features and we're looking into that right now. Uh, and sirs, ma'ams, Listen, we're talking about multi-capable airmen today, right? But we don't know how to get there. This is how we get there. We simplify their daily tasks so that we can expand their bandwidth so they can do more with less. So you got a spark from me with a caveat, and that is I'd like to, I'd like to push this in USAFE because that's where the lead is, but I wanna ask, I'm gonna ask AETC to take a look at this in terms of scaling it across the Air Force and into our training. Yes, sir. Nice job. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. And our final team into the spark tank, the portable magnetic aircraft covers team. Why should our coolest fifth generation Raptor get wrapped in burlap and styrofoam when it could be adorned in sexy Raptor athleisure? Sleek, high-performance clothing for our surfaces, most badass air dominance athlete. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Meyer as a maintenance officer. This is Tech Sergeant Caban, a Raptor crew chief and the idea inventor, and Major Scar Van Timmeren, a Raptor pilot. And we're here today from the first fighter wing to talk about portable magnetic aircraft covers, or PMAC. 
Every aircraft in the Air Force has a full set of covers for its intakes, ports, and exhausts. We call them Dash 21, and they must be installed whenever the aircraft is parked. They're kind of like car covers, and they're meant to protect against damage. Anywhere our aircraft go, this gear must accompany them at every stop. And so multiple stops means multiple sets of this big, bulky gear. A Raptor deployment normally requires three sets per jet, and that's roughly the size of a Humvee. And because pallet positions on airlift are at a premium, we're forced to choose between parts that can actually fix the jets and these. Additionally, Dash 21 costs entirely too much and can even damage the aircraft. We have to wedge these intake covers into place, which can damage the aircraft's sensitive coatings. It'd be kind of like if you had a car cover that was made out of sandpaper. Another great example is the beta port cover. This $7,000 cover fails in a matter of six months, causing an additional $7,000 worth of damage and a jet that takes two days to repair. In every sense, these covers are doing more harm than good. And we're reminded of this anytime we have to move our aircraft, which can sometimes be on pretty short notice. Hurricanes Florence and Michael strengthened so quickly that we had less than 48 hours to move our aircraft to safety. Unfortunately, our logistical tail with our Dash 21 never caught up. And so we were forced to secure our $8 billion fleet with garbage bags and masking tape. PMAX solves the logistics, maintenance, and cost challenges associated with our current Dash 21 gear. PMAC is made out of waterproof material and adheres to the aircraft using magnets whose strength will be varied depending on where they are on the aircraft in order to not damage sensitive underlying components. Inside each side weapons bay of the Raptor is a one cubic foot storage area we call the birdcage. An entire set of PMAC to protect the aircraft will fit inside the birdcage. So what we're going to do is take this ridiculous plug that fits in this ungodly bag and turn it into this foldable material that will go with the aircraft it's meant to protect. PMAC will solve the logistics problem. Like Lieutenant Meyer said, our current Dash 21 adheres to the aircraft using friction and force, causing damage. PMAC rests upon the aircraft, causing no damage. Finally, in partnership with an already awarded Cibber Phase 1 vendor, we've realized 40% cost savings in manufacture. And if we had this rolled out Raptor nationwide last calendar year, we would have already saved $200,000 in airlift costs alone. You combine those three things in General Goldfinger, you're going to get more jets to the high-end fight. This truly is a joint coalition and dual use sieve mill solution that has endless capability and scalability worldwide. What we're asking for is $500,000 in order to perfect the magnet strengths, get the dimensions on point, get flight certified, and get this scaled to multiple MDSs so we can get this bout to the warfighter. Thank you. Do I understand correctly that the plugs can actually smudge the paint, meaning like the anti-reflective coating makes the, a stealthy aircraft not stealthy? Yes, uh, I come from a maintainer's perspective because I'm a crew chief and I have to fix these when these go down. Uh, I don't want extra work, but uh, as far <laughs> as uh, it's a weapon system, they could see us if our stealth coating is visible. And so there are missions you can't do because uh, it's not just cosmetic damage, it just impairs the mission. Yes, sir. So a quick story, not to eat up your time, but there I was, Captain Goldfein, Shaw Air Force Base, right, on an operational readiness inspection, and I started my airplane, and it had a standby gen fail or something. I had to jump into the spare, so I had looked at my watch. I had six minutes to get an A-plus. All I had to do was roll. I ran to the jet, climbed up the ladder, didn't strap in, started the jet, pushed up the motor, all of a sudden, bang, the whole airplane started shaking. I shut down, crew chief just shaking his head. <laughs> I said, did we do it? He said, yes, sir, we just ate the intake cover. <laughs> oh. So my question is, is this digestible? <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent question, because the first, the first thing anybody asks is FOD. FOD, that's at the forefront of uh, us and uh, the partners that uh, was awarded to the phase one's uh, question. So we're putting, implementing FOD protection into it. And so one of the ideas is uh, running a lanyard to the grounding traps on there. So if you crank on the engine, it will hold it there. By that time, you'll see them flapping, so you'll know. Well, the, the message to the crowd is you can be an idiot and become cheapest staff at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this fits 
<laughs> snugly inside, does this, how does this uh, attach? How does it attach to, does it inflate? Or I mean, how does, from that little folded up thing, yeah. I was uh, wondering, that correlates into what I just handed you. Yeah. I'm sure you guys were just looking at it like, what is this? A beer coaster. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually it is a coaster, but it uses uh, programmable magnets. The new technology called polymagnets works like a pixel. These are maxils, so you could control the strength. So if you have some sensitive uh, electrical component behind the panel or, or whatever you're adhering it to, you could control it not to affect any things. See that? That's the magnetic field yep. that you can see there. So you could program the magnetic field to specific characteristics. There's an image in there. I know everybody can't see it, but but it's in the magnetic field. Did you look at this? You had you had some pictures of international other airplanes, wherever you. So you have looked at this for all different. Diff there's nothing that limits this to an F-22, right? You can get any, pretty much any intake. Yes, sir. Side. We actually went out to uh, Nellis during Red Flag. It was a perfect opportunity. So we went around, looked at the B1s, like 16s, 15s, and we found applications and design uh, ideas for all of them. So. They're definitely scalable, not just to aircraft, spacecraft. I know that's big right now, so. <laughs> but definitely. Now, digesting one of these in a spacecraft would be really <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that excite me so much is seeing these cross-disciplinary teams coming together to come up with these exciting ideas. Ah, this gets a spark for me. Yeah, big big thing about this one is deployability, right? I mean, this is, I mean, because home station, as bad as it is, we can get by with these, but this is about an expedition Air Force, Air Force has got to go forward, right? And so that fits in the cockpit or wherever you take it in the airplane, right? So every airplane deployed with its own covers, we're talking here, and I think your example of a Tyndall, right, where you deployed forward, maintenance train never got there, and you end up having to use, what, duct tape and, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, amen, nice job, spark Thank from you. me. Awesome. All right, spark judges, we'd love to hear from all of you. Do we have a spark? We have a spark. spark. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Don't, don't forget your gear. All right. All right. Wow. I think this was the best spark tank yet. What do you think of these airmen? And what about these judges? And don't forget that you, the audience, are the final judge. The poll closes in 60 seconds, so very quickly enter your vote. And judges, now please take some time to cast your vote and get your vo uh, votes ready for the finals. So only six teams were selected for the stage today, but we received hundreds of awesome submissions from airmen through the ideation pl platform. And we are going to continue to work with all of those ideas to make sure that they are successful or that they at least learn a lot. And there's many resources out there for the grassroots innovator. We currently have over 70 spark cells in the total force all around the world. These wing level innovation organizations are solving problems like these every day. Additionally, we have resources like the Small Business Innovation Research or CIBR. If you're interested in CIBR, this March, 10th through 12th, there's going to be an event called a Spark Collider in Austin, Texas. We invite all of you to come out there. And while the judges are deliberating, we have a message from our fearless Vice Chief of Staff regarding the next big Air Force challenge where we need your help. Let's take a look. Thank you for volunteering to serve during what is arguably one of the most transformative times in our military's history. Our national defense strategy is clear. Our nation is in a great power competition. The good news is that we have the best airmen in the history of warfighting. To dominate in an era of peer competition, the first thing we need to do is unshackle our airmen. That is why I'm excited to announce that this year's Vice Chief Challenge focuses on leveraging technology to give you back the most valuable thing we can your time. Your air staff is eager to give you a direct voice in redefining, streamlining, and eliminating processes that bog our airmen down and consume your time. Things like securing PCS orders, navigating the maze of VFMP programs, 
processing evaluations and decorations, and so much more. We don't just want your help, we need it. Because no one knows better what creates drag in our Air Force than our airmen and NCOs serving on the front lines. Speed wins. Together we'll go faster and further, ensuring we are ready when our nation calls. I'm excited to hear your ideas and see what we can make possible. On behalf of Secretary Barrett, Chief Raymond and Chief Goldfein, and the millions of Americans that depend on the daily sacrifices of you and your family. Thank you. The future is yours to build. Aim high, Airmen. All right, John, it's about time to pass on that trophy. Even though there can only be one champion, you're all winners in my heart. You're getting soft, Tony. All right, judges, we'll have you come forward with our secret ballots here. All right, and now it's time for the moment of truth when we find out who is the 2020 Spark Tank champion. Here we go. The secretary says. Low cost threat emitter. Low cost threat emitter. And Tony says, Mercury. the Mercury Project. General Goldfein says, low cost threat emitter. Gene says, Mercury. <laughs> Chief Wright says, digital airmen, robotic process automation. And the airmen say, the K wedge. And the winner is, the low cost threat emitter. Isn't it? No, we have a tie. Oh, do we have a tie? We have a tie. Oh my gosh, Tony, this has never happened before. This is our first tie. This is like that Academy Award <laughs> moment when they said, what did they say? La La Land? Yeah, and it was Moonlight? Yeah. We're, oh my we're, goodness. We're, at, we're in the same situation here. Uh -oh. so what, what Good should... thing we actually have a backup plan. This is the Air Force. We have Dr. Roper here in the audience, and he has agreed to help us with our tie breaking round. Tony, I think they might have done this on purpose. I know, oh, Dr. Say? Roper, if you could join Dr. us. Dr. Roper, on come the on stage. up, please. All right, our judges have deliberated all right. to, to break the tie. So Dr. Roper. Well, one, let me say to all of the entrants, that was awesome. I am so energized by the creativity you bring. I truly believe innovation is a battlefield and you guys are winning it. So you crushed it today. I'll tell you something else. Um, the great thing about being in the Air Force right now is you can break the rules. So I think we buy the 3D printer from that one proposal, print two more trophies, and have three winners this year for the first time in Spark Tank. All of you deserve to have your ideas go live. We're going to make it happen. All right. All right. So, so Mercury, a low-cost threat emitter. So this has never happened. Come forward. We're going to have you hold yeah. up this cup. Mercury team. Mercury and low-cost threat emitter, come on up. All right, John, you're going to have to hand over the cup to two teams. All right. And judges, if we can get you over behind the finalists, we'll take a nice picture here. All right. Ma'am, if we can get you right in there. Oh, sorry. All right, come on in. Yep. All right, guys, let's get the secretary in there, too. All right, and Dr. Roper, you can get All right. Here, Chief. Sir, can you get in for the picture? Yeah, run.
you Ladies don't have to stop clapping just because we're, for all of just because we're uh, holding up the trophy. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Please enjoy your coffee and come right back here for a fireside chat with our illustrious General Thompson and Elon Musk. We hope to see you back here next year on stage. And until then, keep, keep generating, generating those sparks. sparks. Thank you, guys.